I'd like to call the October 17th, 2023 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission to order. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Let's begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to read the ethics reminder to the board. In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by the board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office, and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and public manner. Is there any item on the agenda the outcome of which would have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters voted on by the board at this meeting tonight. All right, we come to the consent agenda. Um, commissioners, are there any questions about any items on the consent agenda? Do any members of the public have any questions about any items on the consent agenda? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda and to follow the remainder of the agenda as published? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, uh, we now come to public comment. <clears throat> Uh, we have a list of folks that have signed up, and so I'm going to go through the list. I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name. Uh, once we get through the list, if there's anyone else that would like to speak during public comment, uh, there'll be an opportunity to do that. Uh, everyone gets three minutes to address the board. You'll get an orange light when there's about 30 seconds left and a red light when your time's up, and we ask that folks discontinue your public comment once your time's up because we want to give everyone the same amount of time. Um, okay, the first person that signed up is Steve Legay. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to address the Buncombe County Commission. My name is Steve Legay. I live in Buncombe County and I'm a proud member of Healthcare for All Western North Carolina. We are a group of community activists committed to changing the badly broken U.S. healthcare system. We began in 2017 and advocate for a universal single payer healthcare system covering all people in the United States from birth to death. We say healthcare is a human right for everyone that should be guaranteed by law. The problems with the current healthcare system are profound. We pay more for health care in the U.S. than any other nation, yet we get poorer outcomes. Those costs are often overwhelming for individuals, small businesses, state, county, and local governments. Our life expectancy is the lowest among peer nations, while infant and maternal mortality are the highest, and both of those are rising. Maternal mortality among black women is exceptionally high, three times the rate for white women. Approximately 30 million people are uninsured, and another 40 million are underinsured. Lack of coverage is crucial. Research has shown that a single-payer system with universal coverage could have saved more than 338,000 lives and over $100 billion in costs during the COVID pandemic alone. Kaiser Health News has documented that 100 million Americans are struggling with medical debt. Medical debt is the leading cause of bankruptcy in the U.S., disproportionately <laughs> impacting people of color, rural residents, and poor people, and most of those facing bankruptcy actually have health insurance. And yet the current health care system remains highly profitable for insurance companies, pharmaceuticals, hospitals, and private equity firms. These problems directly impact residents of Buncombe County. The Buncombe County Community Health Assessment of 2021 cites examples of resource gaps affecting our residents, including the cost of health care, a shortage of providers, particularly providers of color, the lack of available appointments, lack of transportation, and more. 
and that same report established birth outcomes and infant mortality to be the number one priority community health issue for our county. Most of us probably know of someone who can't afford medical care or who has put off needed medical care or who has stretched medications or received overwhelming bills. Those stories are common. Buncombe has a strong record of addressing national and even global issues impacting our residents. Those issues include but are not limited to climate change, reparations for those harmed by the historic practices of human enslavement and post-slavery racism, air pollution and environmental quality, historic preservation, gender inequality, and more. Indeed, the county and city's lawsuit against HCA mission is a clear example of challenging harmful and illegal practices like understaffing and monopolization. I salute you for recognizing national issues are at the root of things. I ask that you support our resolution, which you have a copy of, distributed to you by Stacy. Thank you for your time. My name is Dee Dee Stiles. I live by a creek in Swannanoa that is currently almost dry. Here is an analogy that I think applies to what is happening with steep slope development in Buncombe and surrounding counties. It's like if we started out on a trip to a good place, but we didn't study the map before we started. So along the way, we took a wrong turn and got on a road that led over a cliff. We need to stop, look at the map, go back to where we made the mistake and start going right. The county started out thinking letting all those expensive houses be built up on the mountain would be a good thing. We didn't look at the map. We didn't start by figuring out, we made a wrong turn. We didn't start by figuring out how that was going to affect how the mountain stored up water and how that was going to affect the creeks and springs. This current drought is showing us that things can get bad, creeks and springs where there is upslope development are going dry. Some towns are having to conserve water and this is not that bad of a drought. We must stop, have a moratorium until we can figure out how to build on steep slopes and still let water soak into the mountains. We must retrofit already existing developments so that they do not interfere with the millions year old system that has sustained life here. Then we can lift the moratorium and let development begin in a better way. Even now, under the rules in place, things would be, things would be better if the county had more staff in erosion control office. Some contractors are not following the rules we already have in place. There are not enough staff people to check out newly disturbed sites. Even when neighbors call the office with complaints, the staff can't get to the site for several days or more. Please put a moratorium on steep slope development until we figure out how to do it right. And please, please, Hire more staff for the Erosion Control Department. I am glad the Comprehensive Plan won an award, but the proof is in the pudding. It's only as good as what we do in its name. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Jim Barham. Okay. Um, Marsha. Um, from Healthcare for All. Okay, yeah, sorry, I can try to introvert that. I'm Marcia Fretwell. Hello, and thanks for hearing our plea. Uh, I'm a retired physician who spent my professional career in private practice caring for older patients. It was a wonderful experience. I wish that the physicians who were practicing today had as many positive feelings as I do about my career. I now see the fact that my patients had a nonprofit health insurance. They were all old, so they were all over 65, so they all had Medicare. So I essentially practiced in a single payer system um, for about 30 years and found it incredibly 
easy to earn a living and in fact deliver care without worrying about whether my, my patients actually had coverage. So moving to a public single payer with private practice for medicine will benefit everybody in this room, every single one of you. The county government will be relieved of the $38 million obligation of funding healthcare insurance for its employees and those county residents who cannot afford for-profit health insurance. Young people will have the freedom to explore all work opportunities while being able to practice preventative health care under insurance coverage. Middle-aged folks, starting to get some of you, um, will have job mobility and relief from watching their children and friends suffer without adequate coverage or access to care. Older aged people, that's me, will not have to sit by and watch the for-profit health insurers continue to do what they do best. And what is that? It is profiteering from our tax dollars and absolutely limiting access to health care throughout the United States. So I implore you as the commissioners to support our resolution. I'm with Steve, by the way. He's now stepped <laughs> there. You go. Uh, and I implore the rest of you to become activists in protecting our health care dollars from the for-profit health insurance industry. I hope you can see it's a win-win proposition. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. All right, Jessica Caulfield. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this time. Uh, my name is Jessica Cofield, and I am the president of Asheville Sister Cities, which is a nonprofit here in Asheville that operates um, in conjunction with Asheville government, city government, and uh, runs the relationship of our seven sister city programs. Um, I wanted to take this time because uh, around the world, October is Sister Cities International uh, Month. And so uh, we are encouraged in all of our communities to come before our city governments and um, give a state of what has been happening this year. And for Asheville, it's been quite a bit. Um, we've had a relationship with Sister Cities organization since 1992 and just celebrated 30 years last year. So it's our 31st. Um, our mission is to promote and further the message of peace and understanding between individuals and communities through a foundation of friendship. Um, we send and receive delegates from our cities around the world, and we were currently about to host a Mexican delegation um, here in Asheville. And also um, our, a group from U the University of North Carolina in Asheville um, visited our sister city in France and um, got to experience what that's like as well. So also we have twice been awarded the best overall program in the United States for cities with a population of our size. And this year this, we received an award um, for our 2020 work with the Melipona B project that took place in Valladolid. Um, I want to also invite all of you here and all of you in the room as well and anyone watching um, to join us for our programming and our events. It's the relationships that are established between individuals that truly make a difference in what we do. Um, and I thank you for those who have attended. I've seen Commissioner Moore at many of our events, so thank you. Um, and coming up, it'll be October 29th, which is a Sunday. Um, and one thing to note is that we are the only active Sister Cities program in Buncombe County. So we might be tied directly to the city of Asheville, but we service all of Buncombe County. Um, so it'll be at the Weaverville Community Center. Uh, it's a Day of the Dead celebration with, um, we'll have altars and our group from Valladolid will be here from Mexico. Um, it's going to be a big celebration starting at 4 p.m. on October 29th. So um, check out AshevilleSisterCities.org for more information. And thank you all for your continued support.
Okay, great. Thanks, Jessica. All right, are there any other members of the public who would like to address the board during public comment? Okay, well, thanks everyone who took time to, time to come out this evening. Um, all right, uh, next item under good news. Uh, we have Nate Pennington who's gonna talk to us about the um, APA Marvin Collins Award for the Comprehensive Plan in Buncombe County. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners, happy to be here uh, today and present something that was a bit unexpected. Uh, we just attended the um, State uh, American Planning Association North Carolina Conference, uh, sent some folks down there and received two awards. And we'd like to introduce you. Uh, the comprehensive plan, as you know, is completed and adopted. Just to read you a quick snippet that sort of outlines uh, the two awards themselves and why they were recognized, the North Carolina chapter of the American Planning Association is an association of 1,400 professional and citizen planners working to preserve great places and create a bright future for North Carolina. Uh, the APA North Carolina Marvin Collins Planning Awards program annually recognizes agencies and individuals that have completed outstanding plans, programs, and projects have excelled as planning studies or have made notable contributions to the planning profession. The awards signify the highest standards of achievement for planning in North Carolina and highlight work that is worthy of attention. It is a competitive process. I'd like our CAPE team to first introduce the one we were first told about and then we'll talk about the second. Yes, thank you. We were very excited to be traveling to Durham last week to accept the Mar Marvin Collins Award for the community engagement strategies used for the 2043 plan. It continues to always be an honor to serve the county and reach people, inform uh, our residents with the most current information and get their ideas. And it really depended on us to come back out to explain what we're gonna do next. And we're just very proud of this award. <laughs> <laughs> So we were totally excited about the one award, and then we got a second one for the best overall plan for the state of North Carolina. So that's big news. Thank you very much for all the support. That's great news and well, <clears throat> well earned. Thank you very, so very much. You guys make us proud. Appreciate it. Okay, next up, I've got a couple presentations. Uh, the first one is from the Board of Equalization and Review. And Miriam McKinney is here to talk to us this evening. Thanks for coming. I'm Miriam McKinney. I am Madam Chair for the Board of Equalization and Review, and I'm here to give you guys an update. About us, the members of the board are myself, Mark Morris, who is Vice Chair, Philip Price, who is a local attorney, Michael Colgate, which is a broker, and Jonathan Hunter, who is an appraiser and broker as well. The purpose of our board, we are a special board uh, that's appointed by you guys, the county commissioners, to hear appeals from the county residents <coughs> as it relates to property assessment. The activities that we participate in as a board, we hear and decide any timely filed appeal, we examine and review tax, tax listings for the current year, we assure any change is made under the provisions of the statutes. We notify the taxpayers of any decisions rendered by the board, and we assure that the taxpayer has received due process under the provisions of the North Carolina General Statute. I wanna update you guys about um, what has happened in the 2022 session. The Board of Equal Equalization and Review, we had a total of 36 appeals. 
also in 2022, we started um, live streaming. And so we had 756 views when we started doing that. We have just started the 2023 session. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow and we will be continuing to meet from now until the end of the year to until all of the appeals are heard. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for the update. And um, thanks for your service on the on the board. Uh, commissioners, are there any, any questions? I, I do have one question, and I, I appreciate you being here. And um, so, um, and I feel like we've been briefed on this, but you know, we get briefed on a lot of stuff and sometimes you need a refresher. So when a property owner has a, wants to, wants to says, I'm not sure this is right. I'm gonna you know, kind of push back on this. When they go through, the, when they decide to go through the process, is it first, like not all appeals directly go to your board. I guess that's my question, right? Those are just like a, a staff level review first. And then if it's not resolved there, then it comes to your board. Is that correct, or, do, or just could you just talk us through kind of how the process works in a little more detail? Sure, absolutely. There have also been um, a lot of changes to how the county, the county is um, very proactive. Um, you know, the taxpayer now has the ability to go online. You can do an online appeal. So there, there has been so much education. So if somebody has an appeal that they want to make, it, they first get in touch with the tax assessor's office. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of times, actually, and Eric is here from the tax office, and he could probably speak to this, but, you know, it only gets to us, the board, if after the assessor's office has had constant communication back and forth mm -hmm. with um, the person that wants to appeal. And then, you know, our job as um, a board is, you know, really to, we, we hear why, Right, um, and then we make our decisions based on that. So, you know, like last year, I think, did I say, we had a total of 36 appeals? Yep. I'm not sure Eric can, I don't know if he has it right off the top of his head about how many appeals came in, but that's kind of the process. We're kind of the, the, the last to, mm -hmm. to get the, uh, the appellant. And is it, is it such that if, uh, so, so, so property owners have an opportunity to sort of try to talk it through with the staff, see if they can, reach a resolution one way or the other. But if someone says, um, by gosh, I just really want to go to the Board of Equalization, then that, that option is there for them if they want to go there. But if they can work it out administratively, obviously that might be simpler for folks. Is that, am I sort of understanding the That's, way people? Absolutely, anybody can come in front of us, but obviously to, to talk with the tax assessor's office to see, you know, <coughs> first of all, what is the issue? What mm -hmm. are they appealing? Um, and sometimes, you know, it's maybe they don't under completely understand, um, but we have so much information for, as a county. The county has done an amazing job um, in terms of educating. Um, you know, there are, are community um, meetings. Um, our, our assessor is actually, I think he, that's why Eric's with me, is because the assessor is at a community meeting right now trying to help, you know, bring some awareness to, you know, the community. So, yes, yeah, so anybody can, uh, you know, appeal um, and they can get to us if they want to. Okay, all right. Great, well, thank you for coming this evening. Thanks for serving on the board. Thank you so much. All right, all right. Uh, our next presentation is from the Sheriff of Buncombe County, Quentin Miller. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it, appreciate your service. And I think he's here to just give us some updates on the, from the Sheriff's Office in Buncombe County. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So uh, I'll start by first saying that these stats that I'm about to present to you is really just Buncombe County. It does not include the city of Asheville. So I'll have to do that first. Oh, this does work, okay. So this, uh, the categories that we'll be covering today will be, I mean, this report, it covers murders, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and arson. And as it says here, it does not include 
like traffic citations or misdemeanor charges. So this is, is not covered in this report. So it's important that you know that, that we're talking, you know, exactly what we're talking about. So the numbers is, as you see, if you have any questions, please stop me at any time if you like, and I'll try to address those. So this is sustained decrease in the SBI and that's for the State Bureau of Investigations. So we do, we do not uh, do these stats. This is what comes from the state. So we haven't tinkered or messed with the numbers or anything of that nature, but it is what it says it is. So you can see in year one, which was 2023, we saw a 15% decrease. And then we go further as you can see that it, we did it in three years. And you, you can see that was a 22% decrease. And then as we do the five year, you could then see that there's a 2% decrease. And then over the 10 years, you can see that there's a 25% decrease and that's in the index crime. What we've done here is broke that down so you can see the raw numbers. And what we did was we showed you larceny, thefts, assaults, or drug, nar narcotics, and breaking and entering. So you can see how many cases we've taken and that's the, those are the stats that you can see and they're broke down so you can basically look at each uh, individual stat and see what that says. So this is about our homicides and um, <clears throat> we've had 17 homicides since I've taken office and of those 17 homicides that we've had, we brought charges in all of those 17 charges or homicides. And it's also interesting, one of the last ones, because if you add the numbers, it comes to 16 and there's one missing and that would be one that occurred inside the city, but they dumped the body in the county. And so we went on and investigated that and we was also able to uh, have charges pressed against those individuals that committed that crime. So some of our strategies is that we targeted high level crime. We targeted repeat offenders. We dismantled theft rings. And then our MAP program, drug treatment program at the jail and the real time intelligence center. What you don't see here and which I think is, you know, critical is vital importance is that our commissioners, which you guys are being a part of this strategy also, and that's your support. It also doesn't show you about our community our community now, we're building relationships with our community and they're assisting us in this. So the sheriff office cannot take credit alone. We must include our community and we must include the commissioners. So I will tell you that these numbers and what you see, you also have to take credit also because I could not have done this or the sheriff office could not do this without your support. And so last, I'll talk about the co-responding unit. And so there's been a lot of discussion about how we can address issues uh, downtown. And, but I'm not just going to put it downtown. I want to say how do we address issues throughout our county. And some of that is how do we do a co-responder model. And some of that we've already started, you know, with um, a lot of this is about a clinician, about a deputy, and about our community paramedics. So a lot of this, again, goes back to how do we work together and try to solve a an issue by how we work together. So again, I don't believe that there's a, a way in doing this without all of us coming to the table and working to address, you know, our, you know, find the solutions that are needed. So again, I must commend the commissioners in their work, but we still have work to do. And then uh, the tri-responder again for us is how do we meet them where they are? And they, and when I refer to who is they, we're talking about the people that are homeless. We're talking about the people who have poverty issues being that they're downtown. And we have other issues, jobs. And so again, I believe that the sheriff office should be a part of it, but we cannot do it alone. And so this is why um, the co-responder is just one of many things or strategies that we should be addressing and taking on as we move forward. So that concludes my uh, report, if you will, and I'm here to ask any questions that you may have. All right, thank you, Sheriff. Commissioners, are there any questions this evening? 
Sheriff, thank you so much to you and your staff for um, sharing this update with us, but also for the, the work that's represented here. Um, and I hope as more people in our community become aware of these statistics that it, that it can help address um, some of the concerns that exist around public safety in our community and, and also help us really focus on um, where we can keep moving the needle to in increase public safety. Um, uh, this is a question for maybe you or maybe someone else in the room, I'm not sure, but I would love to hear um, kind of where things are with the, with the co-responder unit program, if that's currently being piloted or kind of what phase what phase that is at, and um, it seems like, uh, you know, it's something we've been discussing for a long time, so it's really exciting to see it as part of this presentation, and I'll be eager to hear what next steps look like there. So I can speak from the law enforcement, but I would ask Taylor to join me. I guess I'm throwing him under the bus there, <laughs> but uh, I would ask him to join me in uh, that response. So I can tell you that during the summer, we did a pilot program in which that we uh, initiated the tri-responder and so once we did it, I didn't bring the stats with me, but it was very successful that we were now able to answer calls with the co-responder model that we in turn would have called a um, patrolman to do it or a deputy to do it. So which meant they were not equipped really to handle it, but we were able to meet folks where they were at. And so the model is that, you know, we wanted the community paramedics to check them out. And then the next step would be if there are mental health or substance issues, that's where the clinician comes in. But the last thing we would want to do is then do the enforcement with the deputy that's present. And so we just wanted to make sure that people are clear and understand that we have done a pilot. So I can tell you that we are moving, you know, to we can do that more on a permanent basis. I'm very proud of the work that the sheriff's done with us on this project. I think the main thing is linkage of care, connecting people with the right resources at the right time and being involved with them at the community level to make a difference. And that's what the sheriff stood up with our team and did a great job over the summer with this pilot project. And we look at, I believe we just recently got a vehicle that matches ours and you know, we're gonna do some joint stuff moving forward. You know, uh, as part of the additional funding y'all gave us for the paramedic expansion program uh, for community paramedic. And so I think we're doing some real good work here. I think it's, uh, you know, some of the leading work in the nation with MAT as far as being that comprehensive. So uh, both, you know, the program going on in the jail, the program going on in the community, the partnerships with ADAC and MAAC, you know, it's just, providing that great linkage of care and wraparound services. So we look forward to continuing our relationship and being one bunkum strong and making more happen to make a safer community. So thank y'all for, again, like the sheriff said, supporting us so we can support the community. I think I just wanna ask even more about it to, to go into it a little bit further detail. I guess, tell me a little bit more about the, the pilot and your experience with it how it differs from the kind of calls that you would just send community paramedics to and how, I guess, what happened through that pilot process to make you feel like it's better and, and something we should continue and expand and keep going. I guess, to tell, me what, tell me what excites you about keeping it going and keeping it. Well, I'll go first again. <laughs> so what it really excites me is that we're having the right people respond to the situation. When I say the right people, we cannot arrest our way out. You've heard me say that before. And so when we're going to that call, we're now going to that call with help in mind. So we're trying to get resources and that person connected right, right now, opposed to them coming to the jail. So this is like a diversion, if you will, that they do not need to come to the jail when their needs are otherwise mental health or substance use issue, but they end up in our jail. That's something I've talked about before. So what excites me is that we don't, we will not have people coming to our jail. Then I'm not gonna say they don't need to be there, but think about this. Their use, their use or their mental health is the cause of why they're in our jail. It, it is the cause a lot of times and why they're committing crimes, right? And the crimes we're talking about is like misdemeanors. We're talking about panhandling. We're talking about soliciting, if you will. And so we have to, sit down again, but this program gives us opportunity to address
people where they are. If you have mental health, you don't need to be in my jail or our jail. If you have substance issues or substance use, you don't need to be in our jail. You need to be getting some help. We're not equipped in detention to handle a lot of the issues that we're being faced with. But as you all know, that the state of North Carolina, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, we are, you know, that's where's the location that you take people who have mental health and substance use. It's called the county jails. And that's what we're doing, and we have to work at doing, being better at doing that. And I feel the trial responder gives us an alternative to just us bringing people to jail. I think the sheriff pretty much summed it all up there. I think it's the unity of folks working together, connecting the community paramedic, the law enforcement officer, you know, to determine pathways to divert folks out of jail and to keep them out of jail. And that linkage of care going back to having those behavioral issues de-escalated and, and dealt with there on the scene and look at methods of connecting somebody to the services they really need, whether that's drug rehab or that's behavioral health services or whether sometimes just a cooler head prevails. So we, we saw all that in this pilot kind of come together. I'm just excited to see more of it on a larger basis so we can track the data tell a larger story about how this is going to really, in my opinion, be the whole reimagined public safety that the whole nation has been talking about a, a long time, but we see us really following through and getting it done. Yeah, thank you. And that's that's what it feels like to me. I've been hearing that phrase mm -hmm. for years, and I've, I've been wanting someone to piece it together for me on paper uh, and in person, and it you, you feels like you finally have, so that's that's fantastic. I think what this does, in my mind, is this trauma responder model allows us to treat people in need with dignity and humanity. And I believe that all too often we forget as a society that people who need those services are humans just like we are. So I truly appreciate that work from a, from a perspective of just simply being humane and treating our neighbors just the same way we would want to be treated in that same situation. Sheriff Miller, I also want to give a huge shout out to your detention center officers. They are, they have a really tough job and I've had the pleasure over the last couple of months of spending a good bit of time um, meeting with your officers and getting to see their work on a day-to-day -day firsthand basis. And I encourage all y'all to do the same. It is. It is a tough job. We see the, the forward-facing work of our amazing deputies that are always here on the call um, taking care of our residents. And I think we, we all too often forget what is happening in our detention center. And I just wanna give those folks a huge shout out this evening, um, as well as you for your leadership in supporting them. I'll echo, excuse me, I'll echo that appreciation. Thank you both. I think a lot of folks don't see how much work goes in behind the scenes and figuring out how to make these systems work together. You're dealing at an intersection of behavioral health issues, mental health issues, law enforcement in the traditional sense, and what co-response can look like with EMS and, and how we're addressing the root causes of crime, right? It's no longer just about responding to crime. It's what are we doing to move the ball forward in terms of keeping our community safe? And I appreciate these kind of co-responder and co-responder and try response models. Um, and, and honestly, the conversation that's going on behind the scenes, because I know a lot of work goes into coordinating across departments, and just really appreciate everyone really adopting that team approach towards how we're gonna address this, because <coughs> it's gotta be more than traditional notions of public safety. I agree. <clears throat> we can't talk enough about the good work that Sheriff Miller, Tevit, all of you are doing uh, in the community, because I remember when I became a commissioner, several of us, we were talking about spending $50 million to build a new jail to put people in, in it who shouldn't even be in jail. But now, thank goodness, we're looking at uh, other ways that are a lot more positive to the community and to the people we're helping. So keep up the good work. We can't do enough of that. And any money that we spend for this is well spent. I'd much rather do it. <laughs> this way than look at Bill in the new jail. Good gracious. Yeah. All right. Hey, 
appreciate both of you. Uh, thanks for being here, Sheriff. Thanks Thank for the you. updates. Very positive. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Um, we do not have any um, public hearings, uh, Ms. Pender. No. All right. Uh, no old business. So under new business, the first item is uh, consideration of the open space passive bond recreation lands criteria. And Jill Carter's here again to push this over the finish line. Indeed. Um, as you said, I am here tonight to ask the board to adopt the evaluation criteria for projects applying for passive recreation land funds through the open space bond. <clears throat> uh, the staff developed uh, the proposed criteria to include both a set of qualifying criteria and weighted criteria. The qualifying criteria are answered as a yes or no question, and projects must meet these three items in order to move forward for consideration. Um, so projects must be scheduled such that the bond funds can be allocated within the seven-year timeline of the bond. Projects must be geographically located within Buncombe County, and projects must have a plan in place for the long-term management and maintenance of the project. If a project meets all three of these criteria, it will then be evaluated against the weighted criteria. These are scored on a scale, meaning that a project that better meets one of these criterion um, will receive a higher score for that item. The weighted criteria are conservation and environmental impact at 20%, feasibility at 20%, accessibility at 15%, equity at 15%, long-term management and maintenance at 10%, cost and leveraged funding at 10%, alignment with county plans, needs, and priorities at 5%, and finally, safety at 5%. Uh, these criteria were shared with our Passive Recreation Lands Subcommittee, and they voted to recommend the use of these criteria for evaluating projects at their September 7th meeting. We also shared this criteria with the Energy and Environmental Stewardship Subcommittee at their September meeting, and that subcommittee expressed general support for the use of the criteria as well. So as such, again, um, we are here to request that the board adopt these criteria such that staff can move forward with the application and project selection processes for passive recreation lands projects. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Motion to adopt the passive recreation lands evaluation criteria. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> All right. Next item is uh, discussion around the proposed process for the feasibility study on user consolidation. And Rachel Nygaard is here to help us with this item. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Rachel Sawyer Nygaard, and I'm your Strategic Partnerships Director, and here with you this evening um, because I will be offering project coordination um, if we move forward this evening with the role in the School Consolidation Feasibility Study. So as uh, you all know uh, at this time, the North Carolina General Assembly has passed a piece of legislation, House Bill 142, that mandates that our two local school systems, Asheville City Schools and Buncombe County Schools, jointly study a, the feasibility of a merger. Both of those governing bodies, the school boards, have um, voted to designate Buncombe County as the lead entity for that study. So we come before you this evening to request board action to accept the role of lead entity uh, to manage that school consolidation feasibility study and direct staff to solicit a firm, a third party firm to complete that study. Wanted to give a quick snapshot of uh, what is entailed within Buncombe County and Asheville City Schools. Um, this is a map of Buncombe County with some details on each side about the two school systems. Um, you'll see Asheville City Schools noted as ACS in the center of the map in purple. 
the striped area is the city limits of the city of Asheville. And then the shaded areas around the county are each of the six districts um, within Buncombe County Schools. Together across both of these school systems, this represents a combined 54 schools serving nearly 26,000 students and a budget of, bless you, a budget of $417 million. And there's figures there about which portions of the budget come from local allocation, the supplemental tax, state and federal. So our intended process would be, if designated as the lead entity, if we accept that role, is not to complete the study ourselves, but solicit a firm to do so. The solicitation, the scope of work for that is to be determined. Um, I'll talk in a minute about pulling together a project team to inform that, but we included some information here about the kinds of things that we see in studies of this nature. We would be looking for a firm that takes into consideration aspects including academics as well as operational, finance, um, and community impact. So that means looking at each of the students and populations within our student bodies, but by race, by ethnicity, as well as student populations that may be English language learners, economically disadvantaged, people, students with disabilities, et cetera. And um, you'll see mention here of stakeholder and public engagement, that community engagement um, we know is critical to each of the partners that are involved in this study and would we would um, certainly imagine will be central when the team comes together and defines the scope of work. We have pulled together a project team within Buncombe County that brings together several disciplines across departments from communication, budget and finance, um, strategy and innovation, and strategic partnerships. And we've communicated with the schools, with Asheville City and Buncombe County Schools um, to begin getting ideas as well about participants for that project team. Our role as the lead entity will be to coordinate the project, issue that solicitation, select the firm, identify funding, and then issue and oversee that contract. We would look to the project team um, to provide input on the scope, the criteria for selection, um, and to oversee um, the project as we go. Certainly the school systems will have, a, have an important role throughout providing information and then receiving the findings. Um, and at e each stage, having community participation and input to be defined. That can be con connecting with established groups, educator groups, parent groups, um, staff groups, community groups, and it could um, certainly and will, will certainly include engagement at the community uh, as a whole level. Timeline. We know that this study must be returned um, to the General Assembly all the way over on the right of the arrow by February 2025. So we have until February 15th, 2025 to, um, for the Asheville City Board of Education and the Buncombe County Board of Education to report their findings and recommendations. So working backwards, we wanna give as much time as possible for that feasibility study to occur. And if we get going right away, uh, we could have that request for proposals or RFP open in November or December and have submissions reviewed in January and or February with the intended uh, timeline of bringing back to this board in March of 2024, the um, recommended vendor and the request at that time would be to both approve the vendor and to appropriate budget. So throughout between now and March, we would also be working to identify the um, best available source of funding to cover the cost. 
So that brings me back to where I started, which is to, uh, to remind you of what we're here asking of you this evening, um, which is to accept the role of leader. So. Thanks, Rachel. Any questions? Just a quick question. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding that the ultimate recommendations will come jointly from both school boards versus from us. That's the way that the legislation is written. Thank you. Recommendations to the General Assembly from them. Is that what you're asking? D I just wanted to clarify that that's how the, the conclusion of this process works. Mm -hmm. They will issue joint recommendations that will be presented to the General Assembly. When you say joint recommendations? Could you pull the slides back up? <clears throat> On the bottom of the timeline slide, there's a line that's in quotation marks, and this is out of the language from the bill. We have experienced collaborative uh, a collaborative spirit in all of our conversations thus far. Um, and there, I haven't been part of a conversation about where the, uh, where the recommendation authority resides. So far what we have is to look at what the bill tells us, which is that the Buncombe County Board of Education and the Asheville City Board of Education shall report findings and recommendations to the standing committees of the General Assembly hearing election matters by that date. So we'll maybe get some clarification about what exactly the format of that report should take. Um, we expect <coughs> that more of this information will come into clarity as we proceed. We'll just leave that there. Question I've got. I didn't do it. What we're saying is they don't have to take the recommendation from the study. Right. Who's they? Who is they? When you say they, who is they? The school boards. There are multiple ways that the study could be crafted. The study could be crafted to provide findings, options, and or recommendations. Um, ultimately, recommendations have to be produced and agreed upon jointly by the city school board and the county school board. So it, it might make sense to have the <coughs> third party firm provide recommendations. Um, the group might say, let's, bring, let's have them bring us findings and, and we'll use those findings to create recommendations. But when recommendations- you say joint recommendations, <coughs> where does the word joint occur in the legislation? Because, and I'm not trying to be picky about it, I'm just, you know, this is a question where it might just very well be there's not a consensus, right? I mean, maybe there will be, that would be great, but we don't know that at this stage, right? So. I think there's a lot to be determined. I'm glad you asked that, Chairman. Yeah. So we can have our attorneys um, and folks who help us uh, with legislative issues look into that. The word jointly came out of the beginning part of the legislation, mm -hmm. but it, you're right that it wasn't in that. I mean, it's a joint line. feasibility study, but whether, let's just kind of play it out for a second, but whether the Asheville City School Board and the Buncombe County School Board all reach the same conclusion right. about these questions at the end of the process is, is an unknowable thing at this point. So it's a joint feasibility study, but whether the two separate school boards that are independently elected all come to the same conclusion. It's just, we don't, we don't know if that's gonna be possible because they may just have genuine differences of opinion about it, right? Mm -hmm. And that would not be a, I mean, that, I mean, it's okay to, we don't all have to arrive at the same, you know, conclusions about these kind of matters, right? We'll get clarity from the legal perspective, okay. but what you're saying, um, if, the, if the law allows them to come in with separate recommendations, that um, sounds plausible as well. Well, I guess uh, from a process standpoint, yeah, I'm even a little unclear as the new definition. Are, are the school boards legally mandated to issue a recommendation or is it simply that the legislation mandates 
the creation of a feasibility study. And because that's kind of what I understood is like the mandate is to do a feasibility study, uh, not necessarily that each elected school board must it's to must uh, the feasibility that was study. the original our, um, bill, mm -hmm. yeah. just the study, the final bill that was voted on added the words recommendations in there. Mm -hmm. So the to the study or that the school boards must like because I could see how you, like we could hire someone to do a study about something, but that's that's different than mandating the boards make a recommendation. And, and is that what it says? Yeah, I the language that we had on the screen was the exact language, the quotation the, language. The and the original study that was in House Bill 5 just said a study. This House Bill actually added the word report findings and recommendations. So if there's more than one recommendation, that's possible, but at least it would be recommendations need to be included in the report. From each school board, which might be the same or they might be different or we'll see. Yes, and we'll work through that process as we go through this study. But recommendations are included now. Okay. Only the eternal optimist on this. <laughs> I think if this process is done, I was going to say correctly, um, and through a consensus building opportunity and looking at you know the, the way that you're recommending pulling people together to serve, and I'm... I'm really excited that we're actually gonna lead this process from a county perspective. I think our CAPE team has proven time and time again that they are terrific at engaging our community across Buncombe County. Thank you, Lillian and team. Um, I think your awards speak for themselves this evening at your ability to do that. And so I say that to say if, if we are being optimistic through that lens of community engagement, working through this it's going to be uncomfortable. Let's let's own that. It's going to be uncomfortable for everyone involved. That ultimately we'll get to that point where I think there is consensus among both groups as to what what is appropriate um, in terms of recommendations. Again, maybe eternal optimist on this, but I'm I'm hopeful, really hopeful. We all hope you are right, Commissioner Edwards. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Yeah. And, and if uh, I'm wrong, I'll love the optimism. <laughs> and, uh, so, so um, I guess just in terms of thinking about the process too. So we're gonna, I think we're about to vote to support this recommendation, and you know, so the county can lead, can lead the process. Um, and I don't think this is included in the legislative mandate. Um, but in terms of like at the end of the process, I mean, um, and we'll see, we'll see where the recommendations go, but. Um, will the group that participates in the process also report their recommendations back to the commission? I mean, I'm sure we're all going to be watching this with interest, of course, but um, I mean, I would, I guess I would just say I would hope that it would be this, so obviously we learn as much as we can from whatever comes out of this, and I think as we've, you know, we're aware from just sort of talking about the issue, you know, counties can play roles in these processes, so just, anyway, just obviously I would hope we'd be looped in and how it all plays out as well. Yeah, great. Parker? I guess I'm gonna play the pessimist for a moment. Because <laughs> I'm, I think we have good intentions. I think we're thinking about this rationally. I think this presentation and idea and concept is all put together well, fairly, with good intentions behind it. But the people who have mandated us do this without asking anyone, couldn't care less what any of us think or what any of our constituents think. They're not interested in what our constituents think. They just did this because they can. Well, my understanding is all of the legislators from Buncombe County were supportive of this. This is not, I mean, there's been a lot of things mandated down to Buncombe County, and this is another one. But, I mean, my sense is that there was a lot of, not that there's any particular outcome that's preconceived, but that there was, you know, kind of more, I don't know, general interest in it talking about the question than some of the other things that have been dropped on us from Raleigh in the past. But I have i don't know, but I, that's just what I've, I wasn't there when they debated this stuff. That's just what I've sort of heard through the grapevine. I think my point is our comm staff doing a good job at involving the public in this creates the impression that the people that will make this decision perhaps at the end of the day, perhaps they won't make any decision. But the folks that in, the, in Raleigh that might make it aren't interested in that public input. They've never shown us that they are. So we're, we're, I'm, just, I'm just worried and nervous that we're setting an expectation that 
we're in control and that our constituents can and should be involved and that they have some sort of input in this process. That's all, I just want to say that out loud, that's all. Duly noted, uh, with, you know, they're, they're um, I mean, I, I, I definitely get the concern. The community has seen a lot of ideas come out of the state capitol that were not what the people, that have to do with the control of infrastructure and policies and other matters in our community that were definitely not welcomed. I, I, do, I do have some hope that this is, this is a different kind of process, right, and that, um, and even folks who might start off with one preconception of what they think would happen, I mean, if we get through the end of this process and there's just super strong entrenched views on each side, I think it's much less likely anything will change. You know, this is one of these areas where changes, any change is hard. And so if something's gonna happen, my hunch is that it would, it would take a lot of agreement. Uh, otherwise, um, it's just less likely to go anywhere. But I think the concern is, the concerns are real, and I think the community will start off having a lot of those, and which makes having a good process all the more important to show that that's what we're really trying to get at. But uh, any other questions or thoughts on or motion on the recommendation? In so far as it's mandated, I move that we accept the role of lead entity to manage the school consolidation feasibility study. Second. Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thanks, Rachel, appreciate it. Look forward to hearing more updates as it gets going. Um, all right, the next item is a consideration of a budget amendment for the FY23 Department of Environmental Quality Stream Restoration Grant Award. Good evening, commissioners. Now, this budget amendment takes two grants, an ARPA grant through a state appropriation of $2,750,000 and a grant from the North Carolina Land and Water Fund of $1,008,500 to establish a budget for a project to realign and restore Dillingham Creek and Barnesville to reduce future erosion and provide stability to surrounding properties. And I believe you were briefed on this last week. Motion to approve the budget amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We have another budget amendment. I do. To consider? Yes. For vehicle budget carry forwards. So this ordinance establishes budget for vehicles that were not placed into service in fiscal year 23 and for which the actuals must be booked in fiscal year 24. In the general fund, this represents $679,605 of which $183,999 is public health revenue and the remainder appropriated fund balance. In the solid waste enterprise fund, this results in $42,875, which will be an appropriation of fund balance. Motion to approve the budget amendment. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and consideration of a budget amendment for the Woodfin Greenway, Silverline Park, Whitewater Wave, and Riverside Park. Again, I believe you were briefed on this last week. This, or last, yes, at the last meeting. This budget amendment accepts the full awards of two grants, one from the Federal Highway Administration for $11,733,001 and one from the TDA for five, million eight hundred ninety thousand dollars to be used for completion of the Woodfin Greenway and Blue Way. This amendment adds to the existing county funds of two million four hundred sixty thousand dollars previously budgeted for the Woodfin Greenway and brings that budget to fifteen million fifty three thousand one dollar. Additionally three projects are established for projects being completed by the town of Woodfin for which the county is a fiscal agent for the TDA grant. These projects include Silver Line Park for $650,000, the Whitewater Wave for $2,565,497, and Riverside Park for $4,064,503. All three of these projects are passed through dollars from the TDA to the town of Woodfin. The re remaining required match for the Federal Highway Administration grant will be established as the first project in the general obligation open space bond fund 
for $1,273,250. Make a motion to approve the budget amendment for the Woodfin Greenway and Whitewater Wave. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. There's, I think there's some more. Oops, I'm sorry. Is there more that you need from us on that one? Or did that do it? I don't know. That should do it. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, we have a couple of board appointments. Uh, first is the Civic Center Commission. We have one reappointment. Move to reappoint Shea Brown. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, Historic Resources Commission. All, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the EDC, there's two uh, reappointments. I move to appoint Steen and Biswas. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? On the County Board of Adjustments. I move to reappoint Carl Barnard. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And then we have two additional appointments to make, correct? Anyone has a regular member and one reappointment? Yeah. Someone want to make a motion on the on that? I'll move to appoint Craig Allen as the regular member and David Weinstein as the alternate member. Heck. Mm, all, in, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, we appreciate everyone who serves on our boards and commissions. All right. Uh, any updates from our boards and commissions from the commissioners? Uh, we had a great affordable housing committee meeting today, but I don't think there's any like really breaking news <laughs> to share. Uh, but maybe um, after the next one, maybe after the next meeting, we'll have we're we're talking about talking about some things. So <laughs> we might make decisions at the next one uh, to for recommendations that would come forward. All right. A few announcements. November seventh at three p.m., the commissioners will hold their briefing meeting at two hundred College Street, room three two six in downtown Asheville. November 7th at 5 p.m., the commissioners will hold their regular meeting at 200 College Street, room 326 in downtown Asheville. November 16th at 8.30 a.m., there'll be a joint city-county meeting with the National Alliance to End Homelessness work session at Harris Cherokee Center, 87 Haywood Street, Asheville, NC 28801. Uh, Mr. Frew, is there a need for a closed session? Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We're adjourned. <laughs>